All right, welcome back everyone to the second half of our Sea Otter Science Symposium for 2022. Uh, we hope you had a nice lunch break and we are excited uh, for our next slew of speakers. And my name is Chanel Hasen. I'm the Director of Outreach and Community Relations for the Alaka Alliance. Um, and I'm gonna pass things over to Bob Bailey, who's our board president for the Alaka Alliance. Um, and also just so you know, for everyone watching today, please use the Q&A feature if you have any questions for our speakers and we'll do Q&A um, as time allows after their presentations. Go ahead, Bob. Are you, uh, do you want to do your little, your raffle? Your... Oh, yes. Okay. So I've got a, uh, for all those who came back to watch us and learn, I've got a beautiful, um, Emmy Syrup is a local artist and she drew this sea otter with an octopus eating an arm there. Um, and I did a random picker and Dave Lacey. Hey. hey, congratulations. All right, Captain Dave. Yep, I'll get this uh, sent to you, Dave. Super. Thank you, Chanel. Thank you, everybody, for being here. <clears throat> we have a great afternoon lined up for you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, I think, there we go. There you go. Right. <clears throat> so, um, yeah. We heard this morning kind of starting with the broad global view and then uh, scaling down to uh, Steve Rummerill and the great overview of kind of South Coast Rocky Reef ecosystems, um, estuarine ecosystems and kind of the, their status. And then we heard from Lee Torres regarding her work with kelp and uh, gray whales. And you, there will be a number of items that were brought up this morning, actually even including Ralph's talk at the beginning with that fabulous keynote that uh, Tom uh, Calvinese here is going to pick up on. Uh, Tom has been very engaged at the, at the local level. You know, we're talking about thinking globally and acting locally. Well, Tom is the epitome of acting locally uh, in the Port Orford area. Tom received his master's degree in fishery science from Oregon State University. His research interests involved acoustic telemetry study of the movement, behaviors of rockfish and cabazon at Redfish Rocks Marine Reserve, which you can't quite see in the photo there. It's off to the left down towards Humbug Mountain there behind Tom in this photo. But uh, Tom worked as an urchin diver in Port Orford be before beginning his academic work on fishery science. Today, however, he is the manager of the Port Orford Field Station for the Marine Studies Initiative at Oregon State University, serves on the Port of Port Orford uh, Commission, Port Commission as an elected commissioner, and he is the convener, uh, an organizer of the Oregon Kelp Alliance, which Tom will explain to you and uh, more about uh, the Kelp Alliance and the work that's going on in Port Orford. Chanel is going to put into the chat a couple of interesting links related to Tom and to the Oregon Kelp Alliance for your use. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom Calvinese. Tom, it's all yours. You may share screen. All right. Thanks, Bob. I'm going to share my screen now. And this should bring up the first slide of my presentation. And unless you say otherwise, I'm assuming that you're seeing it. Yep, you're good to go. So uh, one correction, I should say, Bob, I was a port commissioner here in Port Orford, but I served out my two terms and uh, am no longer, but that is part of my history for sure. <laughs> you had the good sense not to run again. All right. Yes, I did. Um, and uh, yeah, well, that was, that was kind of a rundown. Uh, I should also mention that I was, like all good grad students, while I was doing my graduate studies, for OSU here at Redfish Rocks, I was also working as an urchin diver at the same time, because you know every grad student has to have a good side hustle unless a NSF proposal comes through, which in my case, it didn't quite. So, uh, <clears throat> but yeah, picking up on uh, what Bob just said, first of all, thank you, Bob and Chanel and the Alaka Alliance for inviting me and uh, for, to all the co-presenters for giving me such a great setup and also to everyone who's tuning in right now, um, really appreciate your time. 
and I hope to take you on a little tour of the Oregon Kelp Alliance, where it came from, and what it's about, who it is, and what we're doing and what we're hoping to do. Uh, I want to just touch on the this morning's presenters talked about really great, uh, great work, uh, so much inspiration and information. Uh, you know, I really keyed in on some of the things Ralph was saying about uh, regenerative work, which is very much what we're focused on. And it's also on local stewardship and uh, support for workforce development. And those are themes that are running through the work that we're doing and uh, hoping to do in the future. Uh, Steve, of course, always, as always, uh, absolutely rich source of ecological data, uh, amazing data sets, all the way up to very current data on what's going on here on the South Coast. Really excited to see that work and see how that fits into these larger collaborations that we're all part of and really appreciate uh, the support and the relationship that we've been developing with the agency and other agencies in terms of the work that we're doing to promote healthy kelp forests in Oregon. And of course, Lee Torres, you know, <clears throat> if you're on, I'll just speak directly to you. Uh, who knew that eight years of whale research here in beautiful Port Orford would bring us together here in the, in the Oregon Kelp Alliance to talk about kelp and whales, uh, but super fascinating work. And what all of this speaks to, to me, is just the importance of seeing the kelp forest as, as it is, as a forest, as an ecosystem. And I'm recalling a conversation I had with Bob Bailey some years back now, when he sort of looked at me and with a sort of a look of epiphany in his eyes and said, you know what, Tom, I just realized something. It's all about the kelp. And that kind of stuck with me, but I uh, just wanna do a slight correction on that. It's all about the kelp forest. And increasingly, we're seeing how important it is to embrace the complexity of this uh, ecosystem and to conduct ourselves on the terrestrial side as we try to address these complex questions and problems from a place also of diversity and of collaboration and of, of complexity of our own. And I think it's going to take that kind of partnership and uh, you know, these kind of alliances <clears throat> to really effectively address the issues. So with that, um, I'm going to jump into the presentation per se and uh, just orient you to a couple of photos here, a nice aerial drone photo taken by Dr. Sarah Hamilton, uh, a diver contemplating a purple sea urchin here in the nearby waters in Nellie's Cove, uh, and another shot of an urchin baron. All, all great photographers. There's another there's a great par partners in this uh, in this work because they bring the undersea world to the people on land who need to sort of help uh, help them understand what's going on there. Um, that central photo was Laura Tesler, and the one on the right was Brandon Cole. So uh, okay. Uh, so what is the Oregon Kelp Alliance? Well, <clears throat> as its name indicates. You know, it's an alliance. Uh, the focus is healthy kelp forests here in Oregon. And as you can see there, it's, um, you know, it's really comprised of a pretty broad spectrum of members and partners, and supporters, everybody from urchin divers to chefs to agencies, scientists, students, community members, tour guides, etc. And I have a long list of people to thank at the end, but just want to give you a sense of the breadth of the group. And I'll talk more about some who some of these people are as we go. Uh, so this first part of the talk uh, is really intended to orient folks to kelp forests in Oregon. And you've heard a lot about that this morning from uh, Steve and Lee, particularly from Steve. So I don't they feel like I need to spend too much time going into the details, but just basically, uh, I guess I'll point out that we primarily are talking, and when we talk about canopy forming kelp, the, what you see on the surface, we're mostly talking about bull kelp here in Oregon, although there are a few stands of giant kelp here and there. Mostly we look at this uh, Nereocystis bull kelp. And the map on the right there was uh, taken from some of Sarah, Dr. Sarah Hamilton's work 
using remote sensing to map out the historical presence of kelp forests along the su southern coast. And uh, from Cape Arago to Orford and Blanco Reefs in Port Orford around Redfish Rocks down to Rogue Reef and all the way down to Brookings, uh, this is a pretty substantial uh, area for kelp forests in Oregon and where we focus a lot of our attention, although not all of it. And I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. So uh, as I said, I can't wait to see the new uh, aerial photos and uh, footage that uh, Steve Rumrell's team has come up with. But I wanna share with you uh, just a couple of maps from prior surveys that were done uh, back between 1999, 2010, uh, to just point out some of these very substantial resources here on the South Coast here, uh, just north of here in Port Orford, it's uh, Orford Reef and Blanco Reef. <clears throat> And then down south of here, off the mouth of the Rogue River in Gold Beach, uh, the Rogue Reef. But there are still some, uh, you know, smaller extents, uh, smaller expanse, but still persistent kelp beds up in places like Deco Depot Bay and a few other spots. Uh, but uh, as you've heard before, uh, we have been starting to call this situation that we found our, find ourselves in here in Oregon. Uh, sort of a perfect storm for Oregon kelp forests that's unfolded over the last few years. But as you also know, has also goes way back hundreds of years or at least a hundred years to uh, the unfortunate hunting out of the sea otters that were here since, you know, since they came about. And so that sort of set the stage for what unfolded much later, uh, going back to 2014 and 15, You've heard already about sunflower, sea flower, sorry, sunflower sea star <laughs> suffering from the sea star wasting syndrome. And these are some photos of a healthy and uh, wasting sunflower sea star and a nice shot there of then one consuming a purple sea urchin. Uh, this is, uh, you know, as Steve pointed out, really interesting recent findings and questions about how directly this might have led to the the problem we're having with urchins right now. I think like many of these questions, there's a lot of complexity there, a lot to unpack and a lot more study to be done. But uh, we do know that they eat the urchins, so they're playing some sort of role. And one of the things that uh, members of our group are looking into is the potential reintroduction or enhancement of these uh, predatory sea stars. And here you see a cute picture of a little tiny baby one that's being raised at University of Washington by Jason Houghton. And the members of our alliance are working directly with them on that. Uh, so fast forward to 2015-16, you may, you probably have already heard about the warm blob that uh, really created some very unfavorable conditions for kelp, for bull kelp in particular here in Oregon. And uh, you know that had a highly negative effect on the bull kelp beds here, um, they don't like that warm water. They really thrive in cold, nutrient-rich water, which was not present at that time. And then uh, around 2016 and 17, I started to get reports, and many of us started to get reports from uh, some of my former urchin diver buddies, that they were seeing some pretty significant changes out at Orford Reef, which was the primary picking grounds for red sea urchin, which is the commercially viable species. And you might recognize that guy on the left of the screen. As Bob mentioned, I worked on the Mach 1 as an urchin diver for a few years. And this is what it looked like uh, during the heyday uh, when the red sea urchin population was healthy. And this was a very typical shot of a boat loaded with, with a red sea urchin harvest uh, on deck there and also in the hold. So that's probably something like 5,000 pounds of red sea urchin. Um, but in the last few years, or, uh, Orford Reef has essentially been more or less abandoned by commercial divers uh, as it's not producing marketable red sea urchin because of the loss of feed. And then as you've also heard, uh, we, see, we saw this uh, major uh, population boom of purple sea urchins. Um, whether, whether, you know, whether or not those are a direct result of predator loss or 
partially a result of predator loss. In any case, they're here. And as you've seen before, they have produced these urchin barrens, which make it uh, virtually impossible for bull kelp to reestablish re itself. <clears throat> and you heard from Steve earlier, some of the work that ODFW did and surveying at Orford Reef and at Redfish Rocks Marine Reserve. And uh, you can see that huge uptick in the late 2010s, 2018 and 19 at both Orford Reef and at Redfish Rocks. So um, we also have some concerns about what's going on in the Marine Protected Area and Marine Reserve. And this is just a shot that I took just south of here over my shoulder. You can see Mount Humbug. And just south of there, uh, speaking of Dave Lacey, Dave and I went out with some friends and did some scouting. And uh, we're really shocked to see this essentially a spine to spine carpet of purple sea urchins with, I guess, that one little anemone exception. Uh, so this is kind of alarming, uh, especially when you used to seeing a healthy kelp forest there just a couple of years before. <clears throat> And so uh, the other thing that's a little bit of a head scratcher is to see how there are differences at these different uh, kelp forest uh, and rocky reef sites. Uh, if we look at Cape Arago to the north, uh, on the south coast to the north, um, you know, there's a lot of variability there. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that in a minute. We see significant declines in kelp coverage at Redfish Rocks and Orford Reef. But at Road Reef, a whole different story that uh, you know, the kelp forests there seem to be healthy. And in fact, urchin divers continue to work and harvest healthy red sea urchin at Orford Reef, sorry, at Road Reef. So we've got all these factors. Uh, we think climate change is a, a, a driver. Uh, maybe there's a, a role for uh, runoff or pollution, lack of top predators, and of course, these sea urchins. And you've heard this already from Steve, that uh, the quote from Scott Groves at ODFW about the 10,000% increase in purple sea urchins estimated at Orford Reef uh, from the 2019 survey. So this is a lot to take in. And uh, you know, so we have to think about our options. <clears throat> Clearly, we need to do more research. And we also need to take action. And a lot of us are thinking that uh, we can do both. We can do both at the same time. We can learn by doing. We can take action and take do experimental work to address the issue while we study the work that we're doing. And so we are. Uh, and I'll be talking in a minute about targeted urchin removals, potentially recovering some sunflower sea stars, doing some kelp outplanting, and then of course, <clears throat> you know, the Lock Alliance's main mission or mission is. Uh, uh, the eventual and potential reintroduction of sea otters. So, uh, you know, we have these options. We're, we're working through them all and trying to figure out what's the best path forward. So, what we've started with here is a uh, kelp forest restoration project that the Oregon Kelp Alliance started uh, a little over a year ago with some support from the Pew Charitable Trust. We started at Nellie's Cove because we were all kind of focused on what was going on at Nellie's Cove. And a lot of us were here working in Port Orford. But very quickly, we heard from divers up and down the coast that uh, there were, this was happening in other places. So very quickly, we heard from people on the south coast, uh, down in Brookings, that they were seeing this at Macklin Cove, that people were seeing something going on at Cape Arago, although we're still not quite clear what's going on there. And then all the way up on the north coast in Pacific City and at Cape Lookout. And more recently on the central coast, uh, we've been engaging with uh, Oregon Coast Aquarium divers to identify sites there that we think are uh, worthy of consideration as restoration sites. So all of these sites were identified by local divers. And so we got started at Nellie's Cove last year. And I'll share a little bit with you about what we were able to do. Uh, first, I again want to say that this was all of this work is being done under, under a scientific take permit from ODFW, and it's been, uh, you know, a really valuable um, partnership 
to work with them to develop this strategy for us to act on this issue, but do it in a structured, thoughtful way. And uh, we've partnered with ReefCheck Oregon. ReefCheck now has an Oregon chapter, working with uh, Dan Abbott and Diana Hollingshead, who's been brought aboard as their Oregon uh, coordinator to conduct surveys at all of these sites prior to any sort of intervention. And the surveys include uh, some of the players you would expect um, that you've heard about this morning, uh, red and purple sea urchins, kelp, of course, red and flat abalone, and sunflower sea stars. And their surveys cover other species, but these are some of the ones that we pay a lot of attention to when uh, we're talking to ODFW and considering this uh, you know, restoration intervention. Uh, so we also are looking at uh, the gonad index in purple sea urchins. We take a subsample from the site before we initiate culling work. And we also did some, look, some work looking at dissolved oxygen levels. Uh, this is just some, video, some visual showing you the difference between what Nellie's Cove looked like in 2017 and what it looked like in 2020. Uh, pretty stark difference, very healthy, thick bull kelp stands and understory kelp in Nellie's Cove, and then suddenly almost nothing. Um, and this is what really caught a lot of folks' attention and got people motivated to start with Nellie's Cove. Uh, forgive me, this, this uh, map is actually backwards. We uh, later, after we made this map, we decided to swap out our treatment and control areas. So the treatment uh, at Nellie's Cove is actually happening in the west side of the cove to the left in this picture, and the control is on the right. And so what that means is uh, we're doing our intervention work on the, in the west cove and using, uh, comparing it to the, to the cove on the right. And those are just some of the urchin densities from the reef check survey that was done prior to the uh, restoration work. <clears throat> and uh, one of our local commercial fishermen coined the term kelp forest defenders when he came, became aware of the work we were doing at Ellie's Cove and planned to do uh, around kelp forests. And he, to, he felt it was, uh, pretty important work because he understood and understands the importance of this habitat for his livelihood as a commercial fisherman. And then uh, turned around and donated part of his halibut catch that weekend to feed a bunch of hungry divers after they spent their time under the water uh, culling sea urchins. So you, what you're seeing here are divers that are preparing to go uh, down, to, down to the site in Nellie's Cove to cull sea urchins using this high-tech device that's being held up there by Grant Hogan uh, in to the right, which is a welding hammer that we use to uh, smash urchins and call them. So uh, this push last summer at Nellie's Cove, here's some numbers. Uh, 30 volunteer divers, many of them repeat divers, came to Nellie's Cove, came to Port Orchard for three weekends, did over a, about 100 dives, and cleared about 40, 46, 700,000, sorry, 46,700 purple sea urchins from the area you see in the map to the left. And um, to be honest, we are still getting started and looking for results on this, uh, but I'll say a little bit more about that later because we're looking at some other pieces of the puzzle. <clears throat> but what this really told us was that uh, this was a meaningful uh, project, meaningful experiment. Uh, we were able to refine our protocols and organize uh, some pretty motivated, enthusiastic divers and also raise awareness about the importance of kelp forests in Oregon. We learned more about Nellie's Cove and then uh, this also invested in our local economy. And speaking of Captain Dave, that's him upper right in the photo. And uh, earlier, someone came by actually to talk to me and asked me a little bit about uh, black spot disease. And you're seeing that in the purple sea urchin that's being held up in the photo. And that's something else we're kind of paying attention to as we do this project, take a look at, uh, are we seeing diseased urchins? Um, so far, not too many, but we're seeing, seeing them here and there. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about a couple of the other sites and then go into some of the other research that we're doing. 
So we were able to start restoration activities up north at what is now, we're now calling Chief Kiawanda Rock, thanks to some research that was done by Dan Abbott at ReefCheck. Uh, it was being called Haystack Rock, and we were running into a lot of confusion about the Haystack Rock at Cannon Beach and this other Haystack Rock, so we just kind of went with this. Uh, but this was surveyed, and we uh, were able to proceed with some restoration activities this summer, just getting started there. Um, the other thing we're learning is like how each each site is unique. There's this problem that's spread, that's happening up and down the coast, but each site has its own unique characteristics. Um, here you see a group of divers going out to the rock aboard uh, Captain Kyle Dodson's uh, oar angling vessel, which was which is fantastic and uh, worked out great for groups of divers. The other unique thing about this site is that there's a lot of free divers on the North Coast. And we were grateful to partner with Oregon Free Diving, uh, Dan Semrad and his crew, and um, Kurt Grote, and so many fantastic uh, free divers and scuba divers working together, taking turns going out there and uh, working at that site. And we also were uh, happy to partner with Lincoln City Audubon, Vol Audubon Society volunteers uh, to help us out with the GONAD index work. And you see folks, uh, the beachgoers and people with kids, curious people coming by and wanting to know what we were doing. And you can see there a purple sea urchin that actually has a little bit of uni, but uh, not great, um, just as an example of what we were doing there. And we're doing that because we wanna see A, the health of the sea urchin population, but it's also a good kind of proxy for the health of the kelp forest and the availability of feed. Uh, so then we have another site up on the North Coast uh, that has been surveyed. Uh, we still need to review those data with ODFW and make a, a plan there. But on the North Coast, we understand from our local team that this is a good alternate to the site at Chief Kiawanda Rock. So we hope to be able to get out there and get started soon. We have another team back here, on, back down on the South Coast, down in Brookings uh, at Macklin Cove, and they have just started to execute their plan. And what we're really trying to do here is um, develop these local teams that can act sort of independently, but in a unified way up and down the coast using the same protocols and uh, data techniques so that we get a, a clear picture of what's going on at these various sites as we, uh, I guess, learn by doing. And then we have another site at Cape Arago and Drake Point. And this is one that's uh, really interesting because we have at the same site, we have uh, really thick kelp, uh, bull kelp beds that seem pretty, like they're in pretty good shape right next to an area that looks very much like an urchin barren. So these are photos that I took there. The one on the left that shows the big uh, bunch of uh, thick kelp bed is actually from a couple of years ago. And I took another photo from that same location this year and it looks very different. Um, so it looks like there's some changes that are occurring there but somewhat slowly. And we are trying to understand better what's happening. So I'm gonna shift gears here and talk a little bit about some of the research that we did this summer with students and interns to try to get at some of the more detailed questions about what we think is going on at these various sites. And I'll start here at uh, Cape Arago with uh, Brooke Ashcraft, who was our Oregon Sea Grant Scholar. It's a great shot of Brooke at the site. <clears throat> and uh, Brooke helped us organize the Chief Kiwanda Rock restoration activities and then wanted to do an independent study. <clears throat> and so went out to this site, a group of all, well, a bunch of us went out there to just sort of scout around and look around it, see if we could sort of take a look at what was going on. Here's Brooke just taking a look at some very large red sea urchins at the site when we were just kind of scouting around and thinking about what her project might look like. <clears throat> and what she came back with was, this idea that we could uh, take samples of purple sea urchins along a sort of a gradient that uh, occurs within the restoration site that we have set up there in the permit. But remember, uh, 
you know, these surveys are required prior to us doing any, uh, you know, any uh, restoration activities. And so it was important that we take a closer look at what's going on here, where you see uh, Brooke identified these cells within our treatment area that extend from an area that looks very much like a kelp forest all the way to an area that looks pretty much like an urchin bear. And so uh, we went out with a group of students and others and uh, sampled those cells, uh, 10 purple sea urchins from each of those cells and brought them back to the lab to examine and measure their gonad index. And uh, I'm cutting this short, but it's cut to the chase. Here's what uh, Brooke found, which was a fairly substantial gonad index in the urchins that were taken out of the area where there was kelp. <clears throat> that A1 cell in particular had some very healthy looking uh, uni in those purple sea urchins. And then you can see the trend out to the area where it looks very much more like a urchin barren. And in fact, you see some uh, very low uh, gonad index in the urchins taken from that area. So that was, <clears throat> that was one of the projects and we expect to follow up on that and continue to flesh out the picture there at um, Arago as we consider how to best proceed at that site. Then back here in Port Orford, another student, Caroline Rice, two students, and Faith Townsend uh, worked together with Dr. Sarah Graven on a project looking at urchin return rates from cold areas. Uh, this is one of the questions we're asking right now, if we go out to remove purple sea urchins in an area to promote kelp forest uh, recovery, uh, how soon might those urchins return to that area? And so uh, Caroline wa was a, uh, sorry, was a uh, un research experience for undergrad student and worked with Faith to do an experimental culling at Nellie's Cove and then follow that up with some uh, video survey, uh, some camera surveys to look at how, how quickly the urchins return to that cold area. And this is just a couple of examples. Uh, she's analyzing her data and has one more trip out there to complete it. But what you're seeing here is a camera drop outside the cold area show, showing a fairly high density of purple sea urchins. And then one that was taken from inside the cold area that's showing one red sea urchin and uh, some fragments of purple sea urchin test from the culling. So stay tuned on that. Uh, we'll hear more from Caroline and uh, very excited to see the results of that project. And then uh, another <clears throat> research project myself and Dr. Ford Evans are working on uh, here on the South Coast and at Hatfield Marine Science Center is a uh, co-culture of dulse, which is an edible red seaweed there on the left, with purple sea urchins that we are taking out of the urchin barren site to see if it's possible to increase the value of those purple sea urchins. And so uh, this involved several students this summer. Uh, Paula was an REU intern this summer and her work focused on the weekly sampling of gonad from the purple sea urchins and measurements uh, to measure the uni growth uh, every week for the 12 week, um, 12 week phase one of that project. And then uh, Jackie was an Oregon Applied Sustainability Experience intern who's now working on her PhD. But while she was here, she was focusing her work on water quality measurements to look at uh, the presence, uh, look for the presence of urchin waste in the form of ammonia and nitrates in the water in the tanks where we were raising the urchins. And the take home there was that the, the dulse actually serves very well as a biological filter to absorb those uh, waste products from the urchins. And so that's really good news uh, as we consider this possible, this possible way to sort of make lemons out of lemonade, if you will. And then uh, Tate Scarpacci has just come aboard as a technician on this project to continue those measurements and uh, to complete that phase one experiment, which has we've just wrapped up. And I'm gonna share some very preliminary data with you, showing you uh, the growth of purple sea urchins that were taken out of an urchin barren by divers from the Oregon Coast Aquarium. 
these urchins actually came from the central coast and urchin barren where they came in with very low gonad index, very low levels of uni in the urchins from the barren. But uh, you can see for yourselves a uh, very, very substantial increase in growth of uni uh, week by week as those urchins fed on the cultivated dulse in the tanks with them. And it's, you're seeing that compared to urchins held in tanks that were not fed. Uh, that was to our control to uh, sort of a simulated urchin barren. So we are just getting started on phase two of this project where we'll be bringing in urchins uh, harvested by commercial divers. And uh, we're considering a couple of different setups uh, on terms of the land-based systems. And so stay tuned on that. But the good news is uh, it checked out. Uh, we can fatten up purple sea urchins with cultivated dulse. And now we're gonna to dial in. Uh, you'll notice there's a difference between Bandon and Port Orford. I don't really have time to go into that right now, but it's just some differences in systems and temperature and water, water supply and things like that. Uh, but we're very excited about this project that will go into year two, but first we'll do phase two with some commercially harvested purple sea urchin. Another project that we're uh, working on launching right now with ReefCheck is to develop a program, a pilot program here in Oregon called Dive Into Science, which is intended to create training opportunities for individuals from historically underrepresented populations in the dive community. And we think that's pretty important. <clears throat> and so we're working with them to launch a pilot program in Oregon. Uh, this is a shot from their California class when they piloted this program last year. And uh, if you want to bring, you want to watch a video that'll bring a tear to your eye, go to their website and watch the short film they put together for the, of this class, taking this class. It's really moving to see these young people experience uh, the underwater environment as divers for the first time. And um, we hope to replicate that project here in Oregon this coming year. And then uh, something I'm super excited to share with you is that the Oregon Kelp Alliance in, uh, worked with our congressional representatives to secure some uh, a congressional appropriation through the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science, NCCOS, uh, for a, a large grant that is going to fund a kelp forest status report and recovery plan that we'll be developing this coming year. And uh, that's super exciting. We're just launching that now. And I have to share some of the rock stars of the Oregon Kelp Alliance team that's leading this project. Uh, we're just now in planning for our 2023 launch on this project with Dr. Sarah Hamilton, Dr. Ann Galloway, Dr. Sarah Graven, Dan Abbott, myself and others. And we'll be bringing some new people on board and working with commercial divers and tribal members, students, and uh, just really excited to launch this project because uh, as you can as you can probably tell, there's still so much we don't know. And we really need to sort of zero in and focus our effort. Uh, as we face this massive issue, we're really going to need to focus our energy, our efforts, our time, and our resources in places where we can expect to see, you know, uh, see effects. And so that's going to require this, uh, this substantial uh, survey and restoration plan. And it's going to be great to partner with like folks at ODFW and look at, look at how we can sort of collaborate, bring all this great information together and come up with a solid plan going forward. And finally, uh, I might be jinxing myself by sharing this with you or jinxing us, but I can't uh, contain myself, uh, but I have to let you know that we also submitted a NOAA habitat restoration proposal that's now in review, which would uh, fund a three-year phased approach using three different tools for kelp forest restoration, including grazer control of primarily purple sea urchins, although possibly reds, uh, kelp outplanting and predator reintroduction, uh, focusing on Pycnopodia sea stars. So uh, wish us luck, light a candle, do a dance, say a prayer, whatever you do to send good luck to people. Um, kelp forests in Oregon really need it and 
we're ready to uh, carry out that project if it gets funded. And I think that's what I have. Um, I should go back and acknowledge the funders uh, from the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science, as I mentioned, Oregon Sea Grant, which is funding the sea urchin and dulse co-culture research and the Pew Charitable Trusts uh, that are funding the experimental kelp forest restoration project. <clears throat> and uh, you can find out more about ORCA, as we call it, at OregonKelp.com or follow us on social media. And I just want to give a shout out to a few folks before I wrap and take questions. Um, I've mentioned several of these. But I, one of the things I really want to emphasize is how important it has been for divers to come forward and speak to their experience as they spend time out there in kelp forests, watching them go away and uh, sound the alarm where, uh, from urchin divers to scientific divers, commercial divers, sport divers, photographers, beer fishermen, free divers, all sort of having this same experience of, holy crap, what the heck is going on? And stepping up to do the work to address it. Uh, so I think that's super important. I've mentioned a little bit some of the other partners. I want to mention the ports of Port Orford and Bandon that are partnering with us on the co-culture project. Um, all the students and interns that you know put in all the hours on these projects, all the community members, the, uh, the tour operators like Dave Lacey at South Coast Tours and uh, or Angling in Pacific City, all the dive shops, uh, Eugene Skin Divers, uh, Coral Sea Scuba and Oregon Free Diving. Of course, the funders at NOAA and at Sea Grant and at Pew, um, Reef Check, uh, the list is just gonna keep going. Um, and of course, uh, the you know, the, the scientists that are really putting in the time to study these really complicated questions at both of our state universities at OSU, where I am, and also at the University of Oregon, at the OIMB, where Aaron Galloway is, and even partners in California, like uh, Sarah Hamilton, student postdoc at UC Davis, and, uh, and uh, also some support from the Oregon Coast Visitors Association, which is helping to support a lot of the communications that we're doing around this work. <clears throat> if you go to the website, you'll see work by Wild Human and The Spout, both some of our digital communications partners. So I'm gonna stop there, uh, probably leaving somebody out. If I left you out, I'm sorry. Um, I'll buy you a beer later. And with <laughs> that, I will uh, open it up to questions. Great. Thanks, Tom. Always fascinating to hear the new updates with ORCA. Um, okay, we do have several questions for you. Um, let's see, by Jenna asks, um, by day 90, are the urchins of a su sufficient size to go to market? And how are people currently paying for purple urchins? Uh, so, <clears throat> so to the first question by by day 90, yeah, they're, they're showing at about 15%, which is suitable for a commercial market. These urchins were gathered under a scientific take permit, which does not permit them to go into the commercial market. That's one of the conditions of the scientific permit. And so those won't, although we can see that they're in really good shape. And I, I'll confess that a few of us have done a little bit of taste testing and I can tell you that the urchin, uh, the dulse fed uni is kind of a thing. It's uh, so look for that on a, on a restaurant plate near you one of these days as we shift into the phase where we will be able to bring urchins from commercial harvest to market. That'll be sort of the next phase of the project. So they will be able to go down that path. And I, I didn't quite get the second question. How I'm much sorry, I think pay? I read it wrong. How much um, do people pay for uni usually? Um, you know, I <laughs> I haven't I haven't bought it in the sushi bar in a while. But I know if you can imagine a, a sushi plate with a couple of pieces of sushi that has uni on it, could probably go for somewhere around I don't know 
with inflation, 15, 20 bucks. Um, and then what we're looking at now is there looks, uh, there looks to be an emerging market for whole urchin and live. So we're starting to explore that. So that price will be, that'll go up. I think we can probably expect to see a, a whole live urchin go for five to 10 bucks. I might be over or underestimating that, but we haven't gotten as far as the uh, market side of it yet. Thanks. Uh, so we've got several questions about some furry critters being reintroduced, perhaps, and your thoughts about it. Um, so I'll throw one at you. Um, coming from a commercial urchin background yourself and knowing fellow commercial urchin divers in Oregon, how do you feel about otter reintroduction um, kind of as an urchin diver, basically? I think that's a really tough question that I, well, I'll say two things. One, I sh I'll say that I don't think that I'm actually the right spokesperson for commercial urchin divers in Oregon. And uh, so with that caveat, I think it's pretty obvious that, um, you know, when you saw the data that Steve Rumrill shared about the price on healthy, uh, particularly reds, uh, you know, I wish that I was making that back when I was the urchin diver, you know, 15 bucks a pound is, uh, that's, a, that's a nice price. And I know that uh, it's a, you know, that is a very, I kind of think of it as, a, as an, almost an artisanal fishery. And so you have a very small number of people, but those people are making a living at that. And so I think those are really important considerations as we look at this, I, I don't think it's fair to, I don't know, I don't think it's fair to minimize the effect of, you know, introducing otters to a place where you have people who are actually making a living at that and uh, how that could potentially affect them. <clears throat> I'm trying to not dodge the question, but also not be speaking necessarily as an authority but to provide the insight that I think is fair for me to provide, I think those are serious considerations. And I know from just anecdotally that when otters came to certain islands in Alaska, where some of the same urchin divers that work here in Oregon actually go and work up in Alaska, uh, there have been some, you know, pretty clearly, you know, that just becomes a place where they can't work anymore. And so I think those are, really important considerations. I, I'm pretty sure that they are being considered. I do think it's important that we don't uh, minimize that because we're talking about a small group of people. Um, anyway, I, I think, I, yeah, I think everybody knows that otters eat healthy urchins. And I think that's another piece of the puzzle that's super important for folks to understand that just like urchin divers don't pick empty urchins, <clears throat> on purpose, we go and we check them, and when they're empty, we move on. And it seems like, based on some of the work done by Josh Smith and people who've taken a look at this, uh, otters are likely to do something similar. It doesn't really pencil out, if you think about it, for them to go and keep cracking open empty urchins. So I think it's also super important to consider that, you know, to think about. You know, it's not really a silver bullet per se to say, well, the otters will take care of the urchin problem. If the urchin problem is a problem of a lot of empty urchins, they are not really fair to the otters to expect them to clean up that mess. Yep. Good job. Um, Michelle asks, uh, what was the timeline slash anticipated release date for the kelp forest restoration and recovery plan? So right now, what we're looking at is a lot of survey work this coming year, and we'll be doing, <clears throat> sorry, I didn't get a chance to really flesh this out, but we'll be doing some, uh, we'll be doing dive surveys, some ROV surveys, and aerial drone surveys, uh, along with some other things, but those are sort of the big pieces of that, and uh, most of that work will be done next year with the intention of uh, synthesis and report in, um, I think we said spring 
for late spring of 2024. Super. All right, well, everyone kind of had similar questions. Um, oh, we have a new one. Ashley asked, thanks, Tom, for your presentation. I wanted to know where you were going to source Pycnopodia for your predator research and restoration. And when will you have word on the NOAA grant? I see a potential for co-culture dulse, purple urchin, and Pycnopodia for conservation aquaculture. Awesome. Uh, well, I think that's a, <clears throat> that's a great question. It gives me a lot of ideas. I will admit that, uh, Excuse me. Uh, Dr. Sarah Graham has kind of uh, taken the point on that part of the proposal. And I know that she's currently doing some work with some folks up at Friday Harbor that are doing that right now. One thing that we were considering was the, to get that part of the project started. And a lot of this is going to be subject to what happens with the current pending ESA listing for Pictopodia. <clears throat> we're not sure how that's going to play out right now but we needed to get the proposal in. So what we proposed was uh, partnering with commercial crabbers to see if we might be able to obtain a few animals uh, from the wild mm -hmm. and then bring them in, work with the uh, Oregon Coast Aquarium to quarantine them, or quarantine them and then uh, introduce them into the uh, restoration site. That's uh, right now, I think that that rolls out in the second phase of the project, so like year two. So we'll have lots of time to get that sorted. There's lots of questions and details to be worked out there. But I think it's a, I think it's a good idea to, to, to explore. And I also like the idea of a potential multi-culture initiative looking at dulse and urchins and pictopodia. Um, all sounds super interesting and exciting. And the uh, the big question, when will we know? I don't know yet. <laughs> We're all holding our breath right now, keeping our fingers crossed. Wish us luck. Mm, and there's a question, I'm not sure I understand it, um, from Jim says, what about kelp forest growing on rafts offshore and water too deep for kelp? <clears throat> Do you know anything about that? Yeah. So. Uh, Obviously, this is uh, maybe it's not obvious, but I've heard this a lot. Um, there's a lot of talk right now about <clears throat> very large scale kelp farming offshore big rafts. Um, I think it's sort of, uh, you know, it's kind of compelling, right, to think about the numbers. Uh, as you heard uh, from Ralph this morning about just the volume of, you know, the, the weight of carbon that is being sucked up by these organisms, right? Super exciting in the, in the context of climate change to think about that. Um, I also think we need to proceed with caution because we're talking about these super large scale projects that have never been done before. And, you know, we've got some uh, examples on the, on the terrestrial side of some of the problems we run into when we take a small idea and scale it up too fast and suddenly we've got this massive, well, I don't know, for example, a massive pig farm. And suddenly you've got all these problems that you didn't have when you just had it at a small scale. Mm -hmm. But these, uh, sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes the problems scale up faster than the benefits. And so it's super important to consider that. Uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be ambitious. But I think it does mean that we should start small. And this is, goes back to some things Ralph was saying this morning, which I totally agree with. And that is that I think it's super important for us to invest in local stewardship and workforce development. <clears throat> A lot of times what I talk to people about in this work is that what we're really trying, <clears throat> excuse me, what we're really trying to do is build, develop a kelp forest stewardship program. You know, this is, we're talking about workforce development. We want to give people learning and training opportunities and potentially, uh, you know, living wage job opportunities to do this work. This is very long, you know, this is a long time horizon that we're looking at here. We didn't get here overnight. We're not going to get out of this overnight. So we really start, have, have to start thinking that way. 
And I think that makes a good argument for trying these things at a small scale. And I should mention that I'm working right now with a partner, a, a commercial fisherman partner, on a self install Kennedy grant proposal to do exactly that, to do a very small scale local kelp regenerative mariculture project here in Port Orford. <clears throat> so wish us luck on that one too. Great. Well, I think that wraps up our time with you today, Tom. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for joining us from Port Orford. Hopefully I'll get down there in November and say hi for a little bit. <laughs>